Christ has risen. Hallelujah. Three weeks ago, I would have considered today an impossibility, that we would be worshiping online for Easter, not possible. But I've come to learn what impossible means in the last few weeks. And right now, all of us, all of our lives have been upended. And the text for today addresses this. We will go to the tomb this morning with Mary and all the others, only to find nothing is the way we expect it is in the most delightful and amazing way. We need this message of Easter today, more than we've needed it in recent years, I think, because this year we are all dealing with our worlds being turned upside down. Not just a few of us, but all of us. Today's liturgy is simplified for the internet. The hymns are abbreviated, the service is truncated, and I'm hoping to keep this to about 18 minutes, which is long for anything on the internet, but still deliver to you the essence of a worship service, which is difficult when we cannot actually meet together in communion. But this too shall pass. Yes, Lord? Amen. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But God, God, who is faithful and just, will will forgive us us our sins sins and and cleanse cleanse us from from all unrighteousness. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and And also also with with you. you. Let us pray. Almighty God, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you overcame death and opened to us the gates of everlasting life. We humbly pray that we may live before you in righteousness and purity forever. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. And so she ran and went to get Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and when they were going toward the tomb, both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping in to look, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. 
When Simon Peter came following him, he went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, was not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in and saw and believed. Uh, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must, ri that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she, sto she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have lain him and that I may take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, do not, do not incline to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And he said these things to her. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to, to you, O Christ. Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father of us and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Newton's first law of motion is kind of strange. It begins with the idea of no motion at all, inertia. It's a postulate in physics that a body at rest remains at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. And likewise, a body in motion remains in motion at a constant speed in a straight line unless acted upon by an outside force. So why is this important for Easter? Well, two reasons, actually, and the first is this. It has to do with inertia, the idea that things remain as they are until a force from outside acts upon it. And I'm wondering if the church hasn't been something like inert for the last, oh, 25 years or so. I don't mean our congregation specifically. I'm talking about the church in general. I think there's pockets of life in the church and have been all around, but in general, it seems to me that the church has been non-reactive with the world, inert, not moving, not engaging, not being influential with the world around us. 
And it dawns on me that that's what the word inert means. It means to be non-reactive, without internal power to move itself. In some manner of speech, inert is not very much alive. And some of you have experienced quite a bit of inertia, I should have imagined, in the last few days, stuck at home, under quarantine. And others of you are just sort of cruising along, focused on what's ahead, moment to moment, trying not to get bumped off your course. Now there's a second reason why I bring this topic up, and that's because of crisis. Let's think of crisis as that outside force that can push us off our couches or knock us off our set directions, change our focus. When we cruise along at a steady state, in a straight line, that's called homeostasis. Homeo meaning the same, and stasis meaning standing in place, staying put. In other words, the same as it ever was. Crisis knocks us out of homeostasis. It upsets it. It tosses us all kittywampus and turns our world upside down, and not in a small way. If you are able to course correct, if you're able to stay on an even keel, then you are not in crisis. Stressed, maybe, but not crisis. If your coping mechanisms are still intact and you're still able to function, then you ain't in crisis. Crisis is when your coping mechanisms are in failure and you do not have the internal or external resources to function beyond the basic maintenance of life. And when crisis is really high, for some people, even the desire to maintain their lives doesn't seem worth the effort. We have three reactions to crisis. The first two are pretty familiar. They have to do with motion. When things collide, we call that fight. And when things are pushed off in a new direction, well, we call that flight. But there's a third reaction, and that is no reaction. Simply to become inert and freeze in place, like a deer caught in a car's headlights. And in our lesson today, we encounter three individuals who are all in crisis, who are all suffering from the cumulative effects of stress. These are people who are in post-traumatic stress crisis. Their homeostasis has been disrupted, their coping mechanisms are in failure, and there's ample evidence to point to impaired cognitive ability. So it's fair to say that the emotional crisis is about as high as it gets, apart from war. When Mary and the others go to the tomb that morning, they are in crisis. They are cognitively impaired recalling only at the last moment that it will be necessary for someone to remove the stone as they are not capable of doing so themselves. Someone must remove the stone for them, otherwise it's a wasted trip, but they plod on. What else can they do but maintain their course, maintain direction until acted upon by some outside force? And when they arrive, they encounter devastation. What they are expecting is not what they find. One more crisis event, one more straw on an already broken camel's back. Maybe that's why they carry on to the tomb the way that they do. What they expect, perhaps, is that the guards might open the tomb for them. Unlikely, but maybe. But to encounter an earthquake... And to find the soldiers, at least according to Matthew, unconscious, in the tomb opened? Another cycle of ongoing traumatic events. And what do they do? They run. Sent careening off in a new direction, and this time to the disciples, to Peter and to John. Peter and John who, what? At this point, with the arrest and the trial and the crucifixion, how much sleep are they functioning on, on top of their crisis? They are inert. They are in stasis. They are not moving. They are sheltering in place. Early in the morning, these women come to them in crisis, speaking nonsense. Well, 
apparently nonsense, something about the body of Jesus being stolen, at least from their perspective, it sounds like crisis, and having encountered this knock on their door, their effect is for them to run. And one of them runs really fast. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. And then arriving at tomb, he is acted upon by what he sees, and he stops. The motion or the emotion inside of him is encountered by an equal and opposite force. And he becomes inert and stands before the entrance of the tomb, frozen in place. Peter arrives, but Peter keeps moving. He is not stopped by a doorway, but he is stopped by the absence of what he hopes to find. That's odd to say, isn't it, that he would hope to find the body of Jesus there? But what did he see? What did they see? Now, I don't know exactly what the disciples saw when they went into the tomb that morning, but I gotta believe it looked something like this. I keep asking, what's strange or unusual in the story? Where is the unexpected we need to be looking for? Because with God, we should always be looking for those kinds of events that are unusual. The first thing I think is strange, and that is that Peter and John leave. They just go. They just take off. Here is a mystery, and they don't stay to say, let's look for clues. They hightail it out of there, and why? Well, I think this must be a fear reaction. Fight, flight, freeze, well, they fly away, back to shelter. Are they afraid of the people, of the officials, of the Pharisees, of the guards, of the government, of the Sanhedrin? Peter is panicked when a little girl IDs him in the court of Caiaphas. Aren't you one of his, she says? And of course, that's where he denies. They will hunker down in fear in the upper room for a very like reason. I would like to inspect what they saw there. I would like to stay and ponder what they found. The text says they saw these things and they believed. Well, what is it that they saw? What is it that they believed? because they did not at this point recall what Jesus had told them or what the scriptures say would happen. If they did, they might have believed that he was alive. Now, I would point out that the Pharisees, who were not cognitively impaired at the moment, did remember what Jesus said. They knew that he had claimed that he would rise up from the dead, and they understood this so well that they went to Pilate and demanded a guard be placed on the tomb and the tomb sealed in order to be made secure. And then, when all of this happens and the guards return to them claiming what they had seen, they pay them off and convince them to keep their mouths shut. You see, they remembered because they had clear heads. The disciples were in crisis. They were cognitively impaired. They were not able to think clearly. They were emotionally inert, stuck, Their hard drives frozen. You can relate, I hope, to the difficulties that people have to make decisions, to think clearly when they are in distress. The next unusual thing I think we should notice in the text is Mary. She stays. They leave, but she stays, frozen in place. She is at a point where she cannot move. Even the disciples can't help her. They leave her. She's abandoned. They walk away. She can't. She just can't. She breaks down and she weeps. This word says it all. Lamentation, bitter weeping. She simply breaks down. Maybe you can relate to this. I don't know where you are emotionally these days. If you are angry and ready to fight, or if you are frightened and ready to run away, or simply overwhelmed and ready to break down and cry. 
But I don't think that's the unusual thing in the story. It's what comes after I find unusual. She looks inside. She is perplexed, as the text says. And at least it says so in Luke. This word perplexed, it, it means to be at a complete and utter loss, gobsmacked, gut punched. And behold, she sees two men in dazzling apparel. She sees angels. Why do you look for the living among the dead, they say to her. Remember what he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. Now, what is unusual about this is that it is without amazement that Mary responds to them. That tells me how deeply she is in crisis. There is a theophany in front of her, and it doesn't seem to impress her. That don't impress me much. Her response is very strange. It's understandable if she were talking to me or to you, but it's strange that the appearance of angels doesn't completely knock her off her feet. In any other opportunity where an angel shows up, people fall to their knees. And she reacts like it's just another day. Maybe it's because she's already knocked off her feet. Maybe it's because she's very nearly out of her head. So the story so far, we can relate to people in crisis because maybe you or someone you know is in crisis right now. Overwhelmed, barely able to function or get through the day. Just moving on to move on, basically on autopilot. Unless something comes to knock you out of your motion, out of your, off of your inert derriere, you're going to stay in crisis, right along with Mary and the rest of the disciples. So let's get on with it. She turns because someone has come up behind her. Or perhaps she turns because now things have gotten so strange, she feels like she's gone over the edge of reality. And there she is. She sees a man in the garden. And I think we can forgive her this mistake because I think it's a very appropriate mistake to make. But she calls him the gardener, thinking that's who he is. When I think maybe that is who he is. If you know, then tell me where he is, that I may take him. I wonder in those words if she still thinks she has the idea that she needs to go and prepare his body, to wash it, to anoint it, to perfume it for his burial. It was high on her to-do list that morning, and she is still trying to get back on course, trying to return to the normal routines, do the rituals that need to be done, anything to make things normal. It's like she's trapped in a nightmare and she needs to be woken up. Mary. He calls her name, but I think it's more than her name. I imagine it would be like if my wife were in the same situation and I said to her, Pankin, in that moment, she would know instantly who it was that was talking to her. And she would look and she would know that it was her husband. Now, Mary knows in this instant who's talking to her. She knows it's impossible and she doesn't care. It's the thing she wants most in that moment to experience his aliveness. For anyone who has lost a loved one, someone close to them, you know that more than anything you can imagine, you would want to have them back with you again. That you would hope they would be alive and with you. And she's experiencing that in reality. And she throws her arms around him and locks him in a great grip of love. But Jesus has work for her to do. And almost immediately, he gives her something to do. Great news to tell hope to share, and more than hope, life to share. Now, I wonder if God is putting us through crisis in order to give us good news to share, to move us off our dead ends, to put us to work again, sharing the great news, the hope, the life. Look around you for what's unusual. Look around you to see what's unexpected. 
For he has called you by name, his pet name for you. You are his beloved. And he lives. And so do you. Amen. The peace which passes understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We bring our gifts and offerings before the altar of the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our God, whatever is going on with this pandemic, if this is a device sent by you to call us to repentance, to realign our relationship with you, then help us to do just that. Even this if even if this is not your plan, but merely an opportunity to call us to repent and return our thoughts to you, then help us to do that. Whatever is behind this, even if this is an incident or accident of nature, let us take this accident and use it to repent and return to a focus where you are speaking to us once more to our hearts, to our minds, through your word, through your spirit. Move us to let go of the attitudes and habits that have turned us inward and help and away from you and to help those who you would have us love and care for. Whatever this is, let us learn from it. Let us gain from it. Do not let it move us to despair or to anger. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all of those who are dealing with the difficulty of being separated from those they love, not being able to bear the burdens of friends or family members because of the risk of breaking quarantine. Help for those who are sinking into loneliness, who are struggling with addiction, who are facing financial crisis or are in marital distress. There are many who are in need now, Lord. Show us how to minister to them in these strange days. Lord, in your mercy. Certainly we remember those who are able to keep working through this pandemic and the unique struggles that they are going through. And especially we pray for those who must stay home and for those who do not have active employment. It's difficult and confusing to navigate these, the government access to lines of relief, but help those who must do so through this process, obtaining their relief, their relief. And on one level, this relief is a complete blessing, but on another, it is a source of debt, a source of concern, anxiety, and worry. We pray for the economy of our nation as a whole, that if it be your will, we may experience a good recovery. And in the meantime, as we wonder if and when we might return to being with people, when we can gather again, when, then we ask your guidance and enlightenment to show us the ways in which we should, should walk among the world. Lord, in your mercy, we bring before your altar and silent prayer, those burdens which weigh upon our hearts. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.